Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 87. And we're off to a good start. It, it, this is The start of these is always such a joy. I just, I just wish a that... A true pleasure. Some, sometime we'll include the 30 seconds before we start. Of as nonsense. As like a special edition mm-hmm. of, of the episodes for people who uh, need some hope in their life, question mark? <laughs> Need something. <laughs> I was anyway. gonna say that that'll be available to anyone who decides they're done with us already, because after that, I'm sure they will be. So, any of our loyal listeners, you, that will not be available. To it will you. never be available to you. Okay, I think that's wise. There are four different news items, three of which are are fairly small. We're gonna move through pretty quickly. Before ah, uh, see, to you the just numbered item. them, Dan. You know what that means? We're not gonna be able to get to all four. You've just jinxed us. I ruined it. I uh, I made the the mistake. You'd think with all the politicians I've seen who've like, I have three ideas about this. And number then they one, never... <laughs> and then number seven. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> number seven, and that's all of them. That was all. <laughs> they listed two. They put them in the wrong order. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thus it is. Fourth little, four items, three of them smaller than the others, one of which, the big one is Twitter and the news of Elon Musk and the merger, in which we're going to look a little more at the, the, the corporate aspect of it and the and just the, the effect it's going to have, why you should care, and so on. But the other three are really interesting, and uh, they'll just take a little less time. The first of which, starting us off a little bit light, the four-day work week, is the U.S. ready? Are you ready, Brad, for the four-day work week? I'm ready for the two-day work week. You know, I really think I can start working that extra day. You know, let's make it happen. (laughs) I saw this headline, and that was the title of it. Um, There's a variety of other news articles related to this, this idea because the California state legislature is currently, or previously, I guess it was late, a week ago was the last date. I, I haven't actually followed this. Uh, in California, but the idea and how it's phrased just really, really lit me, right? Just, just tilted me very quickly. Is the U.S. ready for a four-day work week? And I think Brad's response there sums it up pretty well for all of us. I'd prefer zero days <laughs> of of like required work. You know, mm-hmm. maybe I, I enjoy a lot of the things that I work at and I would consider it you know, work-like effort at certain things. But in terms of how many days do I want to be at the beck and call of of a paycheck, zero seems like the right amount. I don't know why we mm-hmm, would jump mm-hmm. to four. Yeah, while while we're talking, you know, what we're ready for, let's go all in here. Yeah, <laughs> yes. If I, can, if I can be blunt, I would prefer zero. Is that an option? <laughs> this is just, the reason this upsets me is because to phrase it that way is to to fundamentally misunderstand the way the world works at a basic level. Of course that's what we want. Of course we'd like to work less in terms of, as I said, it being the, the normal negative aspects of work. We don't want those. But why why is that a group question? Mm-hmm. Why is it that that's not a question that I'm asking myself and people who are willing to pay me, you know, or exchange goods and services with me? It's isn't working less mean I get paid less? What's why is this phrased this way? And the answer mm-hmm. is very simple. What they're suggesting is they make the government make a you know through the through the force of law we're going to say that beyond 32 hours a week four eights you're going to have to pay overtime and this is the same way we got the 5 day work week the government made a law that said beyond 40 hours a week you're going to have to pay overtime you're going to have to pay time and a half 1.5 times the pay right And so for people working an hourly wage, this effectively disincentivizes companies from making them work beyond a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. 
Is that how progress is made in the world? We get together and we go, you know what? I don't like working. Do you like working? <laughs> like, is this is this really? Let's how... collectively stop ourselves from working. Yeah. What if? What if, Brad? If you and I don't like work, what if we got together and we made the police charge the companies that we work for, or the the other employees out there, employers out there, and we force them to pay us extra beyond a certain amount? That seems like a good deal for us. <laughs> I don't see a downside. Well, and it's it's fantastic because we've already accepted the fact that uh, corporations are are purely evil and are profiteering, <laughs> yeah. which means yeah. they've got these huge reserves of profits that serve no purpose whatsoever. And therefore, the only downside is that they can only have one corporate jet instead of two, you know? <laughs> That's right. That's right. The only downside is it's going to be hard to fight them off because they have so much power. Yeah, but assuming you can get it passed, yeah. there will be basically no downside. There'll be no downside. This, mm -hmm. this, yeah, this language of labor, and we've, we've been... We've been hitting this idea in both of our last two episodes. Corporations have a lot – there is a lot of bad press, bad ill will towards corporations in general that I think is entirely undeserved. And then there are areas where we should absolutely hate corporate laws and the way corporations are formed and, the, and a, lot of the, a lot of the legal structure around them I think is entirely unjust – uh, and has and, and gives them privileges and favors they shouldn't have. And, and so I, I feel like our ire is entirely misdirected as a people towards the parts of a corporation that actually make it respond to what the people want. Mm -hmm. And when it should be directed towards some of the laws that are under the table that we just we just don't see and don't think about. Um, but again here, this is this is one of those cases where the simple it's this simple view of pro labor where the businesses are powerful and big, and so they are corrupt and evil, which there is some correlation mm -hmm. in. I, power does tend to corrupt. And then you have the people, the working man who is just trodden upon and, and needs to be defended. And the way you do that is through the force of law in which you, you get progress by doing this kind of thing. This is, this is labor movement mentality. It goes back to, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, talking about the square deal, and I'm sure you could trace it back farther, but Teddy Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson to FDR, kind of the big, the, mm -hmm. the early genesis of it is a popular thing in politics. Uh, before that, you could see it in the states, states like New York, and the the way laws developed there because of the labor movement. And anyway, it, it's got a it's got a long and checkered history, but but it's so what so simple. Mm -hmm. So two dimensional. It really is, especially especially because the the world is not made up of giant corporations and employees. It's not that simple. There's so much more to it than that. And in this case, let's assume that all our assumptions are right. That these giant corporations, all our assumptions, and I'm saying the general assumptions that go into laws people. like yeah. this, you know that that there's these giant corporations like Amazon and Walmart who have their giant coffers who could be paying more, who this bill's not really going to wreck them, right? Mm-hmm. So this law goes into effect and, and Walmart and Amazon just start paying more, right? Problem solved. Well, not so much because Walmart and Amazon are not the only two companies that currently exist in California. I think there's at least seven. And, <laughs> and some of Assuming those- Assuming they haven't been nationalized yet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the state no, hasn't taken No, them. but seriously though, <laughs> there's a lot of small companies that are often local that aren't franchises, that aren't- you know, national yeah. companies that don't have those large coffers, which is why we always say we should support local, right? Support these local businesses who aren't making much of a profit, except what's going to happen to those small local businesses who can no longer hire the three people they hired before who are all working 40 hours a week without paying them considerably more when they're just barely making ends meet right now. You know, what is that mom and pop shop supposed to do? Well, the answer is simple. They're going to close up shop and some of that market share is going to go to the bigger companies who do have 
the deeper pockets to make adjustments and deal with these restrictions. And I don't accept the premise that all of these big corporations are evil, all these underlying principles. But there is one principle here that's definitely at work, which is that larger companies are definitely more equipped to handle new government policies than smaller companies are. Yes. Because regardless of how these companies decide to deal with it, whether it's paying employees more or hiring more part-time employees or or changing up how they do business in some way to cover this change, that's going to be easier for a large corporation to do than for a small corporation to do. And that's something that time and time again means that the more government intervention you have in the market, the more you encourage just having a few giant conglomerates instead of having a bunch of small companies. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that the labor movement comes out, really comes out of Europe. And Europe never had the free market elements that the US had. Uh, to some degree, Britain did for a time, but a lot of like, like France and, uh, and Germany and some of these places never really did. They went straight from, from, uh, kind of a feudalism into corporatism, into this, this kind of crony capitalism where you get, you get, uh, businesses that are being massively propped up by the governments as, as these, uh, public entities and goods that are, it, it, it just, uh, so many of the ideas that we're talking about here and that the labor movement is trying to address make so much more sense in the context of Europe mm -hmm. because, because they were never seeing the things that we're seeing, but we, we just kind of import them, <laughs> literally import them through the progressive movement that we were pulling from the, the German historical school specifically, uh, uh, the students, the, the people that trained Woodrow Wilson and, and that later on influenced FDR and, and influenced Teddy Roosevelt back there with Woodrow Wilson. These people were, these people were largely Germans. Um, and that whole school of thought, uh, never really made sense in the United States, but it didn't stop us from taking it and acting like we were in exactly the same position they were. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a pushback against a system that is now here that wasn't here back then. Yeah. <laughs> it makes more sense now than it did when they were pushing it initially. But anyway, it, it's just, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting view that is uh, what you were saying, I think was, was right on point that there's, there's just more to it than that. And that, that two dimensional class warfare which has lately been shifted more towards race warfare is just oversimplification. It's oversimplification, and it's also a a, a degree of self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, that this focus on yeah. the large companies is in in a sense making it so that there are only these large companies. Yes, yes, and we talked about unions the other day, right? By by feeling like the only way to advance the cause of the people is through these kind of laws, you create a. Uh, uh, you know, the, politics is a zero sum game. You push yourself into these situations where it's you versus them, or at least seemingly. And, uh, and that's just not the right way to go forward. You can, you can come up with ways to solve so many of these problems without doing that. I, I, well, one quick anecdote, I, I uh, struck me even as a high school student and I was in a high school economics class taught by a coach of some kind who knew nothing about the subject, right? Small, small school district <laughs> in a rural area. This is how it works. You get, you get the classes that no one actually knows and you get someone who likes sports, who's teaching the sports at the school and they, they teach these classes and it's, just, it's fine. So he's teaching economics and he, and he, the teacher lists several problems in the world and he goes, how do we, how do we fix these problems? And every student in there, and this is fine with the high school students, but, uh, but the problem is this mentality continues they go we need we could make a law that does x and then someone says no it's making a law that does y and, and so on and, and the, the solution is always what law should government pass what law mm -hmm. or regulation mm -hmm. needs to change and it's just there are just so many problems in the world and you can solve them and by you, I don't mean go and get everybody to vote. <laughs> I mean, you can solve them, right? We can come up with ways to solve these. That's how, that's how most of the advancements in, in, that have bettered the lives of people throughout the history of the world have been made. Uh, we, we tend to focus on the, the seeming advancements of government, um, 
when so many of the problems were actually solved by people just trying to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And usually in a form that turned out to be profitable. If you want to sustain sustained solution, it needs to make money that allows it to sustain itself and expand and grow. Hence business. Business is not inherently evil. Anyway, let me put the soapbox away and we'll move on. <laughs> this is supposed to be simple and lighthearted. And here we are ranting. <laughs> While I'm over here just thinking about Dan said four, Dan said four things. <laughs> you, were, you were right to call, call foul on the time. Okay, so the second one, number two. This one's more uh, news uh, than uh, than discussion, I suppose, about a political principle and viewpoint in the in the U.S. We'll see by the time we're done. We'll see. Uh, fair enough. So, China is still dedicated to a no a zero COVID policy, meaning as soon as there is the slightest, you know, as soon as there's a case, they go in and they try and stomp it out. Hold on, hold on, real quick. If China had been successful with the zero COVID policy, that would be fantastic. You, you didn't get my joke? Because no. COVID came from China. <laughs> yes, it would have been fantastic yes. if China had a zero COVID <laughs> policy. Because that's what every other country had at the time back in 2020. Everyone had a zero COVID policy and China's like, you know what? Forget that. <laughs> I would have got that joke a year ago. Just, it has been a while, yeah. It's been a while. I, for, I forget the this story has just gone so, through so many phases. So they're con they're continuing with the policy that has failed to the world's continual suffering. <laughs> the world's continual suffering. Yeah, so their their goal is so anytime there's an infection, they try and stomp it out. They they go in and they use a significant amount of force. <laughs> to to stomp it out. And the big the best example of this is Shanghai. So in Shanghai there were a number of cases. Um I don't I don't know the numbers. I didn't I looked at them, I read the numbers. I'm not sure it's even worth stating what the numbers said cuz I'm 100% sure it's BS. They're not going to give you the real numbers. There's no reason for them to give you the real numbers and the Chinese government is the only people who could give you numbers at all. They're yeah, not there's, letting there's no accountability, teams of people. yeah. Right, right. There's there's no other source. It's going to be BS. So they've locked down Shanghai. They locked it down four weeks ago. Parts of it, not all of it at once. There's a river that divides it. Uh, this is a city of 25 million people. Massive. And when we say lockdown, what do we mean? They didn't say you need a good reason to go out of your house. This was not a US lockdown. No. No. They have literally installed metal barriers in front of places for a variety of reasons. Not Not every house. Like, like in front of doors, you're in an apartment complex and you wake up one day and you look out your window and there is a metal fence barricading you in. It's insane. It's, that is, that is a level of commitment that you're not going to see for good reason from any Western country. You're just not going to do that is, is egregious as, uh, I mean, I suppose Australia got somewhat close. They had like roving bands of police officers like patrolling to make sure you stayed indoors. But this is this is truly dystopian stuff. No, and honestly that that not honestly, but uh maybe that's part of the problem is that China got jealous with how, you know, totalitarian <laughs> Australia was Australia. being and they were worried that the mantle of worst country in the world besides North Korea, which is the mantle China's had for a while, was going to be stolen from them. Yeah, they don't want to be third. Don't settle exactly. for second. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Australia really, really reached, punched above its weight in terms of just sheer dictatorship there mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. It was with their camps and whatnot, which we've talked about before. It's crazy. So they're barricading people in. You can, you can see videos online of, of citizens yelling at a city officials and people who were able to move about, whether they're truckers and different things, there's different groups of people who were able to go around people building fences, apparently yelling at them, things like I'm hungry because the obvious problem is if you can't leave your house, where are you getting food? What are you doing for income? What, what, you know, how is, how are the economics working out? Well, the good news is the Chinese government was willing to shoulder that responsibility entirely. And so with all of the skill that we usually see in planned and fully planned economies. 
You have some people getting the same food six times a day. The same, not, and by food, I don't mean a meal. I mean like milk six times a day. And other people getting nothing. The New York Times had an article titled, COVID Lockdowns Revive the Ghosts of a Planned Economy. And it notes how, like most planned economies, this rapidly devolved into black markets. People want food. They're not going to just sit there and starve, right? And, and the government is not going to deliver it. There's, if there was any question in your mind that China could manage this, 25 million people. The food is in stores. Some food is in stores. Shipping's shut down. The problem, Dan, is, is about success rates. You know, um, KFC has, has, a, has a supply problem because they need chicken and it needs to be fresh to a certain degree. And, and they need it in time and they can't have too much. And it, and it becomes a logistical problem that you don't have with companies like McDonald's where the food is packaged in a much more stable form. And as a result, KFC occasionally has shipping issues and they run out of chicken and they have to close their doors or not have chicken. It's something that happens occasionally with KFC. It's one of the – it's unusual for fast food restaurants, right? But it happens periodically, not all the time. It's pretty rarely. Like 99% of the time, KFC is just fine. But every once in a while, there's a hiccup and you'll have KFCs. I mean it happened in the UK where you had KFC closed for like a week because of their supply chain issues. And I bring that up because even in the free market, having any one company do anything perfectly doesn't happen. You know about Amazon. Amazon, sometimes packages don't get delivered. And in fact, it's thousands upon thousands of times because they're delivering so many packages. And then you go and you reorder the package and you get your thing later, right? The problem here is that now you have one entity. Well, there's multiple problems, but at least one of the problems is you have one entity providing for the food for 25 million people. And unlike Amazon, they don't have a fantastic policy where you can get a new one the next day if it doesn't show up today. (laughs) And so the problem is, is even if they're doing it 99% of the time, they're doing it correctly. That still means you have thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people who aren't getting the care and the resources they need in order to live. And that's a huge problem. And that's one of the main problems with planned economies is that you only have one planner. And so any mistake they make is amplified tenfold and a hundredfold versus in the free market. If KFC doesn't have chicken, guess what? You can go somewhere else. You know what I mean? You've right, got other right. options. It's not just KFC. And that's the problem with the planned economy. Right, and they're competing, and so any any time uh, uh, someone else makes an error, that's an opportunity for a business to capitalize and increase their market share. Yeah, and as they yeah. capitalize, their what they're really doing to- is helping fill that need. Yes, yes, right. It's another it's another area where profit turns into people are getting more of what they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the consumer is getting more of what they want, which is which is essentially always the case in terms of. <clears throat> uh, or not always the case, but that's the tendency in, in a market situation because you have to get, you have to persuade them to engage with you. Um, yes. Uh, one of the other things there of note you kind of touched on there is the, is the information problem. Where is the food? It's, it's in stores and things. Uh, they've halted shipping to a large degree. You have to have certain special permits to be able to drive trucks through and around the city. Um, and so, the food in the stores, how do they get that from the people to, from the store to the people who are hungry? Mm-hmm. It's not as simple as just going to the store and grabbing everything and then distributing it, right? You, you, you don't know how much food is there. You don't necessarily know how many people are in any particular place. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how reliable are their numbers on, the, on such things? Right? This is a, so much of this suddenly, so many of the problems that an, an independent human being takes upon themselves, suddenly this government entity has to solve all of them, and they simply don't have the information. And no, and, and, and yeah, because the central planner may have forgotten about a whole neighborhood that needs food. In a market, that neighborhood's not going to forget that they need food. You know <laughs> what I mean? People have a great yeah. understanding of what their own needs are, but I don't understand the needs of even you know this small city that I live in, let alone 25 million people. Right, right. You're, it would, imagine being in the city and you need medication. 
What, how, how on earth is that going to get to you? Who on earth are you going to contact? This, this is not just the problems of a planned economy, which are massive. This is the problem of a planned economy that's assuming the responsibility in an emergency, like just mm-hmm. abruptly. Right? This is, mm-hmm. it's, it's terrible. And there's, China is going to, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually faced real riots, uh, which is not common in China, <laughs> real pushback because starving people are going to have nothing to lose. And, and there's a growing number of them there. Um, you should, if, if you want, want to see something just amazing, you look up, look up some of the fences. It's just crazy. Just crazy to think about. Like you, you were just barricaded into your home by some person working for the, working for the state. It's a, it's a terrifying thought. There's a lot of news about this. Uh, in the long run, what this is resulting in or, or what this ties into, I guess, this is, this is a partial cause of a bigger economic problem with China that we've addressed. This is, this is aggravating the fact that China's, a lot, so much of China, China's investment is malinvestment mm-hmm. because their economic system is bogus. People seem to think that it's the future. It's not. It's the past. It's full of holes. <laughs> it's got massive amounts of problems. And this is aggravating it. And what's happening in response? Investments are pulling out. Massive amounts of money that had been invested in China from foreign groups are leaving. Um, there's another cause of this, which is that the Communist Party has a bad tendency recently to simply seize investments. Be like, oh, hey, thank you for the money. <laughs> this money that you invested here is actually not leaving China. And if you try and pull it out, we're just going to take it. Uh, and that's obviously not a good look either. But China, for a variety of reasons, is becoming more xenophobic, uh, more close to the outsiders. And people are rightfully withdrawing their money from their various investments there. Third point. We're doing great, Brad. We're, 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 we're on track, mostly. <clears throat> the third one is about Disney in Florida. <laughs> Who knew that this would be a topic that you'd one day hear discussed in terms of politics? <laughs> Tell me about Disney in Florida, Brad. Will I recover? <laughs> Deep breaths. You're going to be okay. So so the, the Disney in Florida debacle begins with House Bill 1557, 50, 1557, Parental Rights and Education, which has been dubbed the Don't Say Gay Bill. Which I'm sure yeah, I, everyone. I didn't is doing even know right what the now. first title was. I know the second one. <laughs> I know that one of these titles is not like the other, <laughs> and since there's only two, it's obviously both. So that was poorly phrased. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of these is not like the other. Well, I like that. I like that. This is this is one of these is not like the other. Easy mode. You put two <laughs> things that are not like each other, and and either way, you're right. This is the the preschool edition of that game. Oh, my goodness. Anyways, this bill, which apparently bans saying the word gay, as far as anyone knows, you know, I don't know anyone who's actually went and looked at the bill. We went and actually looked at the bill, and it's a bit more nuanced than that. The There's a couple of things that it does. It changes – how school boards adopt procedures about information. It changes the information they're required to give to parents. It changes uh, different procedures and things like this, blah, 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 right? There's two right. main things. None of those are related specifically to uh, LGBTQ stuff at all. All the procedural changes yeah, are – Yeah, parental notice is not a direct infringement of of LGBTQ and it wouldn't be attacked, Right. But what is attacked is is you finally get to line 97, the section 3, and it says classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through th- grade 3 or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. In other words, when you actually get down to it, what it's saying is that teachers or any other person brought in to teach in a class – Cannot School personnel teach, or third parties. Yeah, cannot teach about sexual orientation or gender identity 
through grade three. So starting in grade four, as long as it's age appropriate or developmentally appropriate, then they can start teaching it. But up until that point, they can't. In other words, they don't want eight-year-olds being taught sexual orientation or gender identity. This doesn't mean that children can't establish their own gender identity. It doesn't mean that teachers can't use preferred pronouns when referring to students. It just means they can't have classroom instruction, which is not nearly as extreme as people might think the law is going to be, considering the uproar that it's that it's raised, that you've got this this conservative state that's passing relatively mild conservative ideology in their education system, which, you know, on a side note, this is how public education works, is that it's education that the majority of the public thinks is appropriate. And so when the majority of the public thinks that gender identity shouldn't be taught to young children, it makes sense that gender identity won't be taught to young (laughs) children. Like, it's not it's not a crazy concept to me, but I'm pretty unique in the sense that I think the whole I'm not a huge fan of public education, and one of the reasons is because of this limitation, because it is education that all the public can agree on, and that's just always, by definition, going to be curtailed in many ways. If you want your children to have a more open-minded education, public school has never been the place for you, So, so look somewhere else. And then, of course, the last part of the the bill actually allows parents to bring um, legal action against the schools if they meet certain criteria, and that is another significant change. So this bill passes. It's not nearly as extreme as people make it out to be, but it quickly becomes an LGD – it quickly becomes (laughs) a uh, a sexual rights activist – Lightning rod, I guess you could say, that that people are quickly rallying around fighting against this mostly because of the principle of it. Because the principle here is whether or not sexual identity should be a part of school curriculum. And obviously the sexual rights activists are saying that, no, from any age, it needs to be a core part of curriculum that they're teaching teaching these children different sexual identities. Yeah. Can I just interrupt you for a quick second? No. It's – it's weird to me that that single sentence that Brad read in its entirety is literally the only sentence in the bill vaguely related to this issue. Like mm-hmm. the, the news truly baffles me on this bill. Do not not say gay bill. I mean, bills bills always get stupid labels that are unrelated. And so in that way, this isn't unique. And, mm-hmm. it, and it happens whichever side the bill originates from. If they can tie it to a hot button issue, they will. Mm-hmm. But it's so misleading. <laughs> the kids could actually talk about their identities with other children even. Right? This, is, this is specifically classroom instruction. The kids could say gay. The kids could say whatever they want. The, the teachers presumably could say it. They just can't have classroom instruction done. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, so it's like a... I don't know. It, it's just odd. It's odd that this bill got so much attention. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So much attention without anyone reading the single relevant sentence. Right? This is actually an extremely short bill. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I was going to say people are like, well, it's a giant bill. How are we going to find that? Yeah, right. No, you, you, you read the bill and it's seven pages, including the summary at the start and, you know, the, the nitty gritty details of how it's going to be enacted. All told, it's seven pages. Anyone can read this. Extremely short for a bill, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You can, you, if you haven't looked at a bill, it'll take you an extra second. If you have looked at a bill, this will take you five minutes because you'll just, you'll skip the beginning, the enactment clause. You'll, you'll get to the text that's specifically being adjusted. You'll find that this is the only relevant text to the political issue that it's being tagged under. And you'll read the single sentence. This is not con- – <laughs> this is re- – <laughs> as far as bills go, this would be a great introduction to look it up and be like, let's look at this bill and let's read it and let's just see what we learn. This this bill would be a great practice bill. There's no 
crazy legalese or anything. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward sentence that if you think about it for a minute, you'll understand what its implications are. Despite the fact that this bill is not nearly as controversial as it sounds, it has become quite controversial. And as I said before, this is this is how public education works, so get used to it. Um, and also let's look at alternatives to public education where we can have different <laughs> yes. kinds of education systems for people who want different kinds of education for their children, which if you want to learn more about that, go back and listen to our – our uh, vouchers episode talking about alternatives to education. Yeah, charter even, schools. And yeah, other charter things, schools yeah. and things like that. Um, but as it stands, the, the the bill passed. It's going into law, and after the fact, there there was a kerfuffle with Disney, where the the C, you know Disney didn't do very much about the bill, which takes place in Florida. You know, you've got Disney's Disney World in Florida. And then after pressure from Disney employees, Disney comes out against the bill after it's passed. So obviously it's not really going to do anything, and they're just making a principled stand in order to not piss off one of the most powerful communities in the U.S., right? Pretty straightforward in terms of how companies navigate the political waters. Disney doesn't want to get canceled. So they're just covering their butts. I'm not aspiring – I'm not attaching any – Moral judgment. <laughs> moral judgment, yeah, or moral praise. Like, I don't think they have this principled, you know, the CEO and the executives of Disney are like, oh, yes, this is what we care about more than anything in the world. No, they're just they're just doing what they can to survive in this climate, um, is my two cents on it anyways. There are activist employees of Disney, as there are of any company seemingly today. But the, the CEO does seem to just be trying to navigate the choppy waters as a result of this you actually have uh desantis who is the governor of Ca of i was gonna say california of florida who as a retaliation to their response to the legislation that was passed attacking disney and how they're attacking disney's industry first of all the fact that desantis is pretty clearly Explaining that the reason he's doing this is to attack Disney because they attacked him is disgusting. Is just <laughs> is just ridiculous. It's disturbing. Um, here's here's a quote from from him that he said on Wednesday: If Disney wants to pick a fight, they chose the wrong guy. I will not allow a woke corporation based in California to run our state. Disney has gone away with special deals from the state of Florida for way too long. Disney thought they ruled Florida. They even tried to attack me to advance their woke agenda. In other words, it's pretty clear, and this is as as he's responding in – with law, he's responding in words. That's linking them to – oh my goodness. Words are hard. Linking the two of them together pretty clearly. Like I thought people were were putting words in his mouth, making it sound like he – no, he, he said it. He said it. He's retaliating, and how he's retaliating is by removing a special status that most of these articles have called a special tax status. And they're like, oh, does that mean they don't have to pay taxes? No, Disney pays considerable amounts of taxes in the state of Florida every year. They pay a lot of taxes. But what happened when Disney World was first created is they struck a deal with the state of Florida. And they created what's called the Reedy Creek Improvement District. And what it allowed them to do was actually create their own district as if it's a town or a county. And instead of going to the county or the town for zoning, for for kind of for infrastructure and all of these other things, they were going to take care of them themselves. And so what that means is that they're able to build new construction without getting it approved by the county. They're able just to take care of it themselves within their district. They're able to supply their own fire department to take care of of things like that. They're able to have their own infrastructure like roads that they maintain and take care of. In fact, they're even able to uh, raise money like a county does for themselves in their own area, um, which is just crazy. The whole thing is really weird and and something that you don't hear about very often, but it's, no, in it's fact, uncommon. But in fact, does happen on a regular basis. Not all the time, but it does happen. And so this special deal which basically allowed Disney to govern itself 
is what I would describe as a socialist or an anti-capitalist worst nightmare of a capitalist dystopia. Not only do they have their own government, you know, where where they govern themselves instead of having the 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 state govern them, but it's not just a bunch of corporations, it's one single mega corporation that controls this area. And it happens to be, you know, the the most magical place on earth, which I found quite quite humorous. Yeah, just imagine a, a Mickey Mouse with red eyes here as we Uh. so so what you're saying brad is that clearly all of the socialists pro-labor people anti-corporation people must are the ones who are trying to take this down right 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 yeah it's it's all the liberals in florida who are trying to get rid of this restriction yeah Mm -hmm. no you've got because you've got a self-governing corporation Yes. And within this district that has immense powers. And that's just taking care of itself. You know, they've got their own fire department. They've got their own yes, roads. Yes, and avoids they're, all kinds of things. Not all taxes, as you were saying, but no, avoids they, some uh, yeah, taxes. Yeah, I mean, they paid about $780 million or more in 2021 in taxes, in state yeah. and local taxes. So they're still paying a huge amount of taxes. The biggest thing that it gives them is control. Yes. You know what I mean? They, they don't yes, have to worry about zoning. They don't have to pain. worry about infrastructure. Cities, most times when big corporations do things, it's always a deal with the city. You know, I yes, work for- the zoning I, is a nightmare. I work for a company, a, a, you know, a furniture company, <laughs> and they wanted to build a warehouse in a city where they have a big store that does a ton of business, and they need to support that that store. The city wouldn't approve it you know they needed to make a deal with the city in order to make their warehouse and the city wouldn't approve it and so they had to change their plans and i was like they can't even build a warehouse without the city specifically approving it and i was like they can't just buy land yeah they can't just buy land and build a warehouse no that's not the world that we live in we don't live in a free market we live in a weird quasi market that is all based on deals between government and business that's just how the world works except in the Reedy Creek Improvement District and others like it. (laughs) It is a magical kingdom. (laughs) (laughs) But, But yeah, so if this actually passed, it wouldn't be as simple as it would sound. No, what would happen is the county governments that are nearby would have to take up all of those responsibilities. They would have to provide a fire department For Disney World, they would have to raise money through taxes to cover all of these new services they would be providing for Disney World. Like it's actually not a good idea. Like Disney is doing a fantastic job here and changing that may not actually make things better for anyone. In fact, it may increase the cost of what's going on. So why is DeSantis doing it? You know, as a Republican, why is this Republican controlled government? passing this legislation as retaliation, which is insane. And now you've got all of these Democrats in Florida and elsewhere who are defending Disney and against the Republicans. (laughs) And I just think this whole thing is beautiful because it's highlighting a few things for me. It's highlighting, number one, Republicans are not actually pro-business or pro-capitalism. They are pro whatever they think will get them elected again, and that's why DeSantis is doing that. And so it pulls back the curtain and illustrates – and by Republicans, I mean Republican politicians. These Republican politicians don't actually care about the principles they say they do. And the same – We're getting closer and closer to Republicans who are – we're getting more Republicans and a – turn within the party that we've discussed before that's going to shift towards Republicans who are like, we're going to get government power and we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. We're going to use it to defeat our enemies in the same way we feel like liberals are doing it. Yeah, and that's exactly what DeSantis is doing. Disney is my enemy, so I'm going to use this government power to punish Disney, which is which is absolutely disgusting. But but that's the first thing is it's peeling back that illusion and 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 it's not just Republicans who are that way because here you have these these Democrats who are like, yes, we need to support Disney, this big corporation, against DeSantis because now Disney is on our side and DeSantis is against us. You know what I mean? It's uh-huh. just sides. It's not about principles. But also, this is 
fantastic because it's peeling back the illusion that county governments are necessary and without them the whole system would fall apart you know that here we have what i would call as some kind of you know libertarian utopia where you have a corporation who's literally just taking care of its own business who's not hurting people who's just creating something beautiful and it can happen and and they're making a huge profit while doing it, and maybe it's not the worst thing in the world for them to be doing that and making a profit at the same time. And instead of less of that, maybe we should see more of that. Maybe we should be handing out special districts all the time to businesses who present a plan for what they're going to do with it. Maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. There, there's an – it's so confused. It's so confused. The sides are are so messed up here. You're in, I agree with you 100%. It's, we, there's an article by Jonah Goldberg. Jonah Goldberg has written influential books, relatively influential books for the, uh, on behalf of Republicans explaining things like, like the fact that fascism is actually a liberal phenomenon is one of the, one of his books is liberal fascism. So he, he writes journal articles all the time. He wrote an article about this in which he described the effort to get rid of Disney's privileges as being driven by libertarian ideology. <laughs> and I couldn't, something inside me just died. <laughs> just like, 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 what, what are you talking about? What, seriously, what are you talking about? You have this, f- this organization of free people who've organized to provide these services for themselves and land that they, they own, right? It's like, like what in what world is it libertarian mm-hmm. to come in and say you have to be a part of the local city governments yeah now we want the county governments to provide those services yeah, you counties, are providing yes. for yourself <laughs> right what 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 on earth is happening and why on earth that whole article was confusing for a variety of other reasons i don't know what what world he lives in anymore but not that not that the world he lived in before was great. Clearly was not the pure, Magic like, Kingdom. <laughs> he left Fox and is now a part of CNN. And uh, Anyway, not that Fox is – neither of which are great, but it's <laughs> – Well, I'd say they're both the worst, but they're yeah, both, continue. <laughs> like, not great of is news the organizations for to work for, those two would not MSNBC, be in my top 20. CNN, Fox, got to be near the bottom. Yeah, it, it's it's bizarre. It's bizarre. All right, but but like I said, the the, the highlight for me is is the the hypocrisy of the the politicians <laughs> combined with realizing such a beautiful thing was even allowed to exist in this world, yeah. and I'd love love to see more of them. You know, it listed several others in Florida that have similar privileges, and I'm like, let's get more of that. I want I want special districts all across the United States. Yeah, what if everything was part of a special district like Ooh, this? Ooh, now we're really talking. <laughs> now, now we're talking libertarian. So uh, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm really curious because DeSantis is being pushed forward as as a prime candidate for president in the next election, assuming Trump doesn't come in and just take it, uh, take the candidacy. Obviously, whether he becomes president would be up. Yeah, to and I think that's becoming less and less likely as time goes on. That he, uh, that, he that runs. Trump, that, tr- or that, no, that Trump or that will he uh, get the nomination. Succeeds. Yes. Whether or not so he too. runs is out so of too. our control, but I think the Republican Party is moving on from Trump finally, which I think is, is a good thing. Well, it'd be, yes, for sure. It's a good thing. Um, if DeSantis, if this reflects DeSantis's general view of how political power should be exercised, this is a bad look. Yeah. This is a like, terrible, this is a terrible precedent. Right. I liked, I liked how he responded to some of COVID. I don't know the details and the details matter in terms of how he enacted things. But in general, you know, his hands off approach, I think has, has proved itself as the, as the right choice for that. It was what we were advocating from the beginning. But if this is, if this is something he sees himself doing a lot more of, exercising the power of government, not to apply general rules to general groups and say, you know, this, businesses have to meet these standards or, or do this thing. And, and, you know, in a way that, in a way that is general, if, if, if you don't want 
If you want government to be arbitrary and abusive, you let it make specific rules for specific groups. We've talked about this before. You don't want Walmart to have specific laws on the books. Walmart does have specific laws on the books. You don't want specific tax benefits to specific companies. And you have that with every city and every state and every <clears throat> and, and the big corporations at the national level. You don't no, want and, that. And, and that's worth distinguishing that part of the reason we're not coming after the the – this Randy Creek district as being special privileges for Disney is because every business in every county has yes. special privileges. Yes. That's not unique. What's unique is getting government out of it. Instead of it being a partnership where they say, hey, we're going to provide a special monopoly for you. They're saying, hey, we're going to we're going to wash our hands of this yes. and just yes. let you do it. That's what's unique, not the special privilege. Yes. And that's absolutely important to point out because, yes, that's what people will look at. They'll look at this. They'll go, there's a special privilege being here. Your general rules don't apply. That seems inconsistent. The special privileges are the norm, which is which makes them much less special and even weirder, <laughs> right? It's even it's even dumber that way. But that's besides mm -hmm. the point. Well, it's because the um, special privileges are for all the big corporations. <laughs> yes, anyone the who can come and and has the resources to negotiate them. Anyone who can who is of such size and worth that they can afford the the fees, which is a, a lobbyist and or a portion of a lobbyist to represent them. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a gross and abusive system and this is a step in the right direction. And I, I really hope that the Republicans resist this tendency and this urge that's being called for from a lot of a lot of people to be like, look, we need to, when we get the power, there are people who are bad actors who are hurting the the common good. That's the same language that Democrats use. We have to fight back and we have to stop them. And that just happens to be all their political enemies, right? Yeah, <laughs> and that's yeah. the same way it is. That's the same way it works with Democrats. And it's, and it's super corrupt. Okay. We're on to the last thing. I was about to say, I guess, I guess we're done with the episode. We've talked about all three, three things we wanted to talk about. <laughs> all three so. things we said initially. <laughs> <laughs> three or seven. One of the two. Finally, we're into Twitter. Twitter, it, Twitter should not B. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you go, Twitter has no impact on my life. This is the part where I tune out. I'm right there with you. I would like to tune out Twitter. I never, I don't like Twitter. I don't like the form. I don't like the way it works. I don't like the people, how they act on it. I don't think any of it's good. I think you can get into the social, <laughs> the social psychology of it. Read people like Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he wrote a really interesting article on this, comparing our society to the Tower of the, the people in the Bible at the time of the Tower of Babel, where the languages are all divided. Uh, everyone, the languages are confounded, so everybody's speaking a different language and they can't communicate with each other. And they're in the ruins of this this tower that they were building to reach to heaven. And that that's a powerful analogy for the way that he, Jonathan Haidt, sees society falling apart into tiny. Uh, First tribes in terms of the political groups, but then even further into uh, disassociated little cells and and essentially falling apart, unraveling mm -hmm. the institutions and so on. And Twitter in this theory, in this social theory of his and others, is that is is a catalyst, mm -hmm. something that accelerates this and aggravates the problems through the forms in which you communicate it. It capitalizes on negative aspects of human behavior and further deteriorates the trust in institutions and so on. That seems likely to me, at least that it's accelerating things. So why are we talking about Twitter? Twitter, because unfortunately- Because we said we had to talk about four things. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> we're obligated at this point. I, we committed. And now that I'm thinking about it, it was a bad idea, but we've already said it and we're going to keep to our word. You never back down in politics. It's, it's always it's always bad. Uh, apparently, you just double down, uh, no matter how stupid the idea is. So, no, but seriously, for some reason, despite its limitations, Twitter is where the influential people have decided to gather and talk to each other. There isn't yeah. a Facebook group of famous people. Yeah, in terms of social media, it's not Instagram, it's not Facebook, it's Twitter. It's this Twitter. is where this is where the powerful voices make their statements. And and again, it's it's weird. It's not the most popular. In fact, we we talked about it once. Isn't it like tenth 
the 10th most popular social media site. It's, it's bizarrely unpopular considering the weight at which it punches uh -huh. in terms of authority and in terms of people of influence. So Twitter is arguably where you go to hear news from influential people. It's, it's become a source of news and a source of statements and, uh, and discussions, despite the fact that it's designed to make discussions painful. Or maybe because it's designed to make discussions <laughs> painful. <laughs> we'll leave that for you to decide. Elon Musk, as we talked about in the last episode, was making an offer to buy Twitter. What we didn't know last week was that they were going to accept it. They Which, made every sign that they're yes, not for, going to. For the record, when I found out that that Twitter had accepted the offer, I thought I had misread it. You know, and I clicked <laughs> and I'm like, wait, hold on, what? How did we go from they are literally taking a poison pill to stop Elon Musk from acquiring their company? Like they're doing everything they can to stop this from happening. To oh yeah, we accepted the offer at basically what he first offered it at. I'm like, wait, so what changed? What changed in these two weeks that I'm missing? <laughs> Where the board goes from, we're going to kill ourselves before we let you buy us. <laughs> so, yeah, sounds good. Here's here's the contract. Done. Done. We'll we'll do that. I don't know. There was a CNN article that was the first article I read about this that acted like this was what was expected. <laughs> They're just like, like uh, yeah, see, they decided to go ahead with the deal. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> what? You can't just state that like it was. Where you had all these news articles talking about how Elon Musk wasn't making a real claim and how this would never work and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like everyone was on the same page. So don't yes. act like that never happened. Don't don't <laughs> yeah. try and erase that entire week from from our memory. It happened. I think this is uh, what they call uh, – what is that? Gaslighting? <laughs> Am I your, gas your, fa <laughs> your favorite term, Dan. <laughs> I your favorite term. term. I hate it. Well, you're the one who just used it, so where's that know. you now? I know. I listen to I listen to politics, and it's everyone's favorite term in politics. It's inevitable. It's going to end up in my vocabulary. I'm just going like, to feel hey, dirty every time I use it. I want the opportunity to be gaslit. <laughs> I want to if be everyone like, else gets a chance to be the victim, you know, where's my chance? Yes, that's that's right. I found it. I found it. CNN gaslit. Um, and yes, so, I was just making your non-victimization a form of victimization. <laughs> <laughs> deal with that <laughs> the the layers here so it happened they accepted the offer as it, brad said it basically the, the original price in fact i for some reason it was not the exact number but maybe i didn't know the exact number again there's there's corporate every time something happens in this exchange i'm baffled <laughs> not per, partially by the decisions of the people but that the decision of the people usually makes sense by the laws and the and the way that it actually functions so there, the deal is going through. Now, there are certain things that must happen that may not happen, but the way people talk about it, they talk about it as if those things are inevitably going to happen and, it's, and everything is basically set in stone. So I, and I have no, no knowledge at all of how these the legal proceedings here are going to work. And so I take that with whatever people seem to think this is happening. So I guess it's happening. <laughs> but... Um, Ultimate confidence. Here's the thing. There, so initially, there were a lot of heavy reactions from Twitter employees. Twitter employees who do things like spend their time censoring comments. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know if I like this, if this is a good idea. <laughs> there was an interesting internal poll that actually found that, it, that the split in terms of employees on whether or not they like the, the acquisition was actually about 50-50. And that seems about right in terms of standard acquisitions. You're going to have a mixed reaction. Mm -hmm. But the coverage is definitely going to be favoring the uh, anti-Elon Musk side. You know, there's been lots of news corporations are happy to support the yeah. freakout because that's more interesting. It is, yes. The anger is going to be more interesting. It's going to get more and, clicks. And news, news, works. news media in general has done a lot of censoring themselves. And yeah, yeah. so having Elon Musk come out and say that he's going to have Twitter be censor free is making some people unhappy. I think it was MSNBC who was who was concerned about Elon Musk's radical views on free speech that would allow all forms of speech and how dangerous that was. Yes. Um, 
the the very clear pushback against free speech has never been so blunt. Has yeah, has never been so clear. Yes. Like it's so clear that they don't want free speech. They only want certain kinds of speech. And yeah. that's a little bit disturbing. Yeah, they'll say things like free speech is racist. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is a change in language. Before they would say, yes, we want free speech, but we also need to to protect people from mm-hmm. hate. Stuff like that, right? They it was it was a both kind of thing. Now it's like, no, 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 no. This is wrong. If this, if this, if this is what free speech means, that free speech is bad. Um, which I think is a mistake in terms of their their marketing. I think that's going to get yeah. significant pushback, but we'll see on that. But it's also refreshing to have that it level is. of honesty. <laughs> Jeez, we'll take the – this is why I like uh, – or at least initially, I guess I haven't heard much about her lately. This is why I like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I may disagree with everything out of her mouth, but she means what she says, which mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. nice. You know, it's a change. Bernie Sanders too, right? Some of these, some of the idealists in the Congress are nice because of that. Um, so as I mentioned, this is going to take months to go through and finalize. <clears throat> um, there's a billion dollar cost if either party backs out. Now, a billion dollars may not sound like much when the deal is forty four billion. A billion dollars is so much money. <laughs> That's so much. You don't just pull that out of your pocket. <laughs> it's. As- it's Go ahead. I was going to say, I just remember a few years ago, the first time hearing about a acquisition deal that was more than a billion dollars and how mind boggling that was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, back when a few years ago, when companies were being acquired for four or five or six billion dollars and they were like, you're going to spend that much on this company. And now it's yeah. just a fee if the deal goes under. Yeah. And I know what some people are thinking. They're thinking, Elon, that is pocket change. Consider this. Rather than sell off stock to pay for this purchase, Musk took out at least to cover, I want to say something like 22 billion of it. He took out a loan. Yeah, he got financing. He got financing. A loan in which he's going to be paying billions in interest over the years, which, which is insane. If what you imagined is that Elon Musk is sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Why doesn't he just pay for this? And this is the point we're going to harp on over and over again because people are so I, – I, they don't understand this at all for some reason. For Elon to simply pay for this with the money he has, he has to cripple his other companies, right? Mm-hmm. He has to pull mm-hmm. money directly out of them and put it into this company, which means that those companies are now worth less and they're doing less. They have less resources. Mm-hmm. He's not He's not sitting on a pile of money. These are productive resources engaged in the companies. So for him to acquire financing actually makes perfect sense. Now, if he fails to pay this loan, fails to make Twitter profitable, which actually seems likely. Which is a possibility. (laughs) It's never been profitable. (laughs) Twitter is one of those companies that's managed to succeed despite the fact it loses money. It's definitely the most valuable company in the world that's not profitable. It's not profitable. The, you know, the hope is always that it's, it's amazing day. that you can create a product that's not yet making money and then sell it for forty four billion dollars. <laughs> that's the dream right there. You talk about profiteering. Everyone who hates profiteering has got to love Twitter because they're not profiteering. <laughs> they're not. Pro- they're supposedly trying but failing. I guess. I guess they have turned to profit finally by accepting Elon's offer. Like, hey, wait, there you go. Boom. We made the money. <laughs> that's right. Now it's his problem. <laughs> It's his problem to make make money out of it. It was just a long, long gamble. They were just hoping to irritate a billionaire enough that he bought him out. And it worked. So. <laughs> one way of looking at it. 4D chess here. <laughs> so uh, um, they can, this deal can still be uh, changed by someone else making a better offer. Someone makes a better offer. Elon gets the opportunity to make a counter offer. And if his offer is higher, they have to go with Elon. Again, weird corporate, uh, mm-hmm. just the way the deal works. And again, I don't know how much of this is is standard corporate law and how much of this is the specific agreement between them. And it's and it's likely a combination. Um, it's likely all in the specific agreement, but some of it has to be there through law. Um, if you want to look at what Musk wants to do um, – Oh, sorry. One, one more note on the contract because this is, this is, uh, 
people are already freaking out and saying that, that Musk has violated the terms of the contract. He has certain stipulations about what he can say and can't say about the merger. And Brad, you found something really important about this, because there were a lot of articles we found immediately that were like, Musk has already violated the agreement. And if he violates the agreement, Twitter can back out and claim the billion dollars, Mm -hmm. which would also be another way it could become profitable. (laughs) Just get money from uh, legal agreements with billionaires who can't uphold their end. Yeah, and, and when you actually read the wording of the contract, it's clearly not saying what everyone thinks that it's saying, and people are misinterpreting it in order to uh, to get Big headlines, news. you know. And and the headline, you know, like for example, you know, you got a headline: Elon Musk already broke his agreement with Twitter. That's a great headline. That's a, that's a headline that's going to get clicks. But yeah, then you raises go, the hope of everyone who doesn't like the the deal and so on. Yeah, but then you go in and you, and you read it, and it becomes clear. That actually the the expert they're referencing doesn't make the claims that they're making. He makes very careful claims. And this is a guy uh I I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but Rafi Melconian, who's got these this ten point uh ten part tweet at least about all these sections of the contracts and what they mean. And they have taken one of one of those sections and misconstrued what he says about what the contract says, which is that Elon Musk is permitted to tweet about the merger specifically as long as the tweets are not disparaging the company or its representatives. And then they go on in this article and they're like, yeah, but Elon Musk has already made disparaging comments about Twitter employees. It's like, well, that doesn't matter because this is specifically talking about him talking about the merger, which is not what he's been talking about. Right. If All Elon of Musk very, is not talking about the merger. Then he can say whatever he wants. He can make disparaging comments. It's, mm-hmm. it's within the context mm-hmm. of discussing the merger that he can't disparage Twitter or its representatives. Mm-hmm. And, and it's an extremely limited context. Which he makes sense dis- yeah. because it doesn't make sense that Elon Musk issues a tweet saying, hey, Twitter's decision about this one particular issue was inappropriate, which is the tweet they're referencing. Him saying that action is extremely inappropriate should not be enough – to blow up an entire deal like this. And it would be insane for it to blow up a deal like yes, this. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, the general rule is something like, uh, the general corporate law rule is, is something like, um, you can't do things that would significantly impact the value of the company. Uh, at least the company can't. The Twitter can't do things. It can't suddenly go self-destruct on purpose. If uh-huh. it did that, Elon would be let out of the deal. Um. And likewise, Elon can't disparage, uh, the, re- I, I'm not, I guess I'm not actually clear on why he can't, in the context of discussing the deal, disparage the company or its representatives. That seems odd to me, but that is, that is the wording and, and easily avoided. He just disparages them without talking about the deal. <laughs> Well, well, it's interesting if you note the wording of that. It talks about how he's permitted to do it instead of him being banned from doing it. And I think it's because this is actually rather than being a restriction, it's being a is it actually a, a permission? Yes, because right. normally when you're talking the about wording. these high level deals, mum's the word that you don't want people saying very much. That's right. And so That's they're specifically saying, "Hey, Elon, you can talk about this merger." As long as you're talking about it positively. And so I think that's why it, it can have that qualifier because it's actually kind of unusual to have this blanket permission that no matter – that he can just talk you're about right, the merger without right. it causing issues. You're right. Again, that's a great point. That's a great point. You're absolutely right. That is a privilege granted and that's why it's worded that way. So – in terms of what Elon Musk actually wants to do, or is there anything else you want to mention in the contract before nope. we, we – we'll say what he wants to do with the company that, uh, that has been so controversial. Specifically, he, he tweeted an explanation of, of what he <laughs> intends to do. I said that as if that was like a clever joke, but it's, – It's not a clever <laughs> joke. It's just going back to what you said before about how this guy just loves to tweet – and that, and we know that's playing a role in the fact that he's acquired this company. And that's yeah. just, it's just weird. It's just weird that someone's hobby can turn into a forty-four billion dollar acquisition. Did you know that Elon Musk really likes the Babylon Bee? 
No. He did like it. He did an interview with them for like several hours. That's he, awesome. And and the Babylon B getting banned is in some ways the catalyst for him being like, okay, I got to do something. They got banned from Twitter for some some <laughs> something to do with gender. I don't remember the details. Anyway, there was a really funny meme. Of a, of a guy hitting like a small domino that then hits a bigger one and a bigger one and then a huge one. <laughs> and it's a, and it, the, the smallest domino was labeled Babylon B gets banned from Twitter. And the biggest one was Elon Musk buys Twitter. <laughs> 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 and it just, just cracked me up, but he, he, for whatever reason, he seems to like them a lot and to the point where he would go and do an interview with this random satire group. I'll say you know the reason. It's because they're satire. They're making fun of power. You know, <laughs> it's, it's who doesn't like that? <laughs> it's true. All right. So here's his. I'm going to read the tweet in its entirety, and then we'll, we'll break down the specific things. The tweet is actually rather short, but entirety makes it sound like this is a big commitment. It's not. I know. <laughs> Quote: I'm go make freeze. some popcorn. Free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy, and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. I also want to make Twitter better than ever by enhancing the product with new features, making the algorithms open source to increase trust, defeating the spam bots, and authenticating all humans. Twitter has tremendous potential. I look forward to working with the company and the community of users to unlock it. So we have free speech. It's the bedrock. He begins with that. He wants free speech. Free speech, of course, is going to be limited by the laws, the laws of the country that it's operating in. The EU in particular has stringent laws against things like hate crimes that affects what you can write and what you can't write. And mm -hmm. Elon noted specifically that he's, of course, going to abide by those laws in those countries. Yeah, so, but in the US, Twitter is definitely censoring much more than they're required to by law. That's and right. And that's something he can easily peel back. That's right. And he's clearly going to. That that mm -hmm. appears to be the point. He is ideologically driven in this case. This does not seem to be a money-making endeavor, though I think he he obviously well, he, plans yeah, to make money. Yeah, he'll plan to that. make it profitable, but Yeah. But this yeah, wasn't and, like the best investment opportunity in term, in terms of finances. Yeah, and, it, and it's worth noting as a, as a quick side note that that the fact that it's a private company allows him to be more ideological about it. And or rather, ideological is usually a negative term. It allows him to put values above profit. Yeah, because he's going to turn this public company into a private company. Yes. He's buying out all of the shares. He's not acquiring 51% of this company, so it's yeah. still public, but he controls it. No, he's buying out the entire company and making it private. Yeah, he which, can make unilateral decisions now. Which is something that, that I'm all in favor of because I think we need more private companies and less public companies because public companies, first of all, are a misnomer, but they also have a lot of really weird incentives. Yes, they do. They do. And and they're ironically enough, they're more for public. Public makes you think it's good for everybody. No, public is more profit driven. Ironically mm -hmm. enough, um, they're more, much more limited. And, and and to some degrees, it's because it was a public company that they almost had to accept this deal, or or they were uh, so obligated by the shareholder interest to accept this deal. Elon Musk can operate Twitter at a loss, putting his values first. Mm -hmm. Um, and the main value he's taking into this commitment to free speech by which he means he said specifically in another tweet i hope the people who disagree with me remain on twitter so we can have a healthy discussion um essentially paraphrasing he, and that uh that's the idea of free speech you're gonna you want to hear all opinions and so that you can have you can see the pros and cons of both you can refine your own opinions and you can become better through this process of dialogue um so I all, he also wants to make Twitter better. There are new features coming. He, he notes uh, included in this is an edit button. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why that's, I don't know how significant that is or insignificant. Before you, you could delete your tweet, but it would delete the whole thread, right? Now you mm -hmm. could edit it and there may be limitations on when you can edit it, but going to have an edit feature. Making the algorithms open source is a bigger deal. This is important because before people were getting banned, and this is true on Facebook, this is true on YouTube. People get banned all the time and they don't know why. People get lots of attention 
or little attention and they don't know why. Mm -hmm. Both the, the level of censorship and the level of, of promoting the videos, neither of these, it's clear why things yeah, are it's happening. Arbitrary. And, and so it appears arbitrary uh, and, and ultimately is because you can, they were doing it on a political basis. If you had the wrong political opinions, you'd get banned or you'd get shadow banned. And shadow banned is where your, how many people see your stuff is artificially throttled without you even knowing it. And now there's, and there's ways you can tell that this is happening. This is not just uh, speculation, though it's hard to prove. Uh, you can, uh, in a lot of cases, consistently, you can, in certain cases, determine this with a lot of uh, uh, veracity, of course. And then, of course, you have internal leaks that are saying, yes, we're doing that. So <laughs> yeah, I guess the internal leaks really clear up the proof. But <laughs> and then you have documents that, that verify this. Um, he's going to get rid of all that. No more of that. You're going to have certain user rules and these things and certain algorithms. And those algorithms are going to be open source, meaning somebody who can program could look at these and could tell you what they're doing exactly. And that's going to be open to the public, meaning, meaning someone else could copy it too. That's the other thing with open source stuff. You can just take the algorithms. Of course, that's not really a big deal because to build a competitor with Twitter, you have to it's just hard with social media. It's not the algorithms that are that are making Twitter work, as evidenced by the fact that they have crappy algorithms and it's still <laughs> working. And it still work. Yes. Um, uh, authenticating, defeating the spam bots, authenticating all humans. This is two sides of the same coin. One of the ways you defeat the spam bots is you authenticate the humans. That way you can't just create and you can't just gather an email address for each new account and create a billion accounts and then have them spamming things. Um, he is. He said he's going to kill the spam bots or die trying in another tweet. <laughs> he's uh, he's absolutely committed to getting rid of that problem. And if he solves it, that would be awesome. There, there is a problem with bots. The, the verification, authentication of all humans is going to be helpful, but that won't solve the problem by itself. It'll, it will help. It will take a chunk out, but he's going to have to do more than that. And that's, uh, and that's it, right? New features, al open algorithms, help with the bots, free speech. Dan, as, as you put it earlier, this makes us almost want to get on Twitter. <laughs> that's right. I looked at this and I was like, well, because before the idea was, I, I know our ideas don't fit with what Twitter was allowing, right? So, so it'd only be a matter of time before if we got big on, if we tr started to get traction on Twitter, we would be shadow banned or censored or something. It'd be unless we were extremely careful, and I don't want to uh, having to walk that line is just a pain. And even if you are careful, uh, often it happens because there's no clear mm -hmm. rules, right? There's mm -hmm. never any. Yeah, uh, you never even get a a why most of the time. You just get some basic customer service employee responding to you, being like, "Oh, you violated the agreement. Mm -hmm. what, are, mm -hmm. what are you talking about?" Mm -hmm. Um, the real question everyone is wondering, the real question that some people are wondering, roughly 25% of the population, maybe 50% of Republicans is, will Donald Trump join Twitter? And I guess all of the liberals, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is he's committed to Truth Social, which is his social media company, which is starting basically right now, and which is just going to get absolutely destroyed by Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Which, guys, for the record, this is best case scenario, because what we're going to have <laughs> is a Twitter platform that is open enough that Trump could be a part of it and is not banned, but that Trump chooses not to be a part of it. <laughs> and if that's not a utopia, I don't know what is. <laughs> There's uh, people who are jokingly taking bets about how long it will be before he folds on True Social. And, and comes back Twitter. to Twitter because he knows that his tweets will go back to being – or he hopes well, or figures that well, they'll go and, back to being really popular. And it's hard to be the underground social media network that's about you know freedom when you've got someone like Elon Musk who's actually making Twitter free. Which, by the way, we talked about this before that we were excited about, about these conservative efforts to – have alternative social media and i still think they're you know there's nothing wrong with them at all and they're absolutely a great idea and more competition is not a bad thing but it's going to be very hard at least in the twitter area you know in, in this kind of social media to compete with what elon musk is doing absolutely it's gonna be very difficult yes really uh the only hope is that 
I, th- I think you could get a significant shift away from Twitter if enough liberals actually leave Twitter, as some of them are doing in response to Elon Musk's. And I'm sure takeover. they're going to jump on Truth Social. Yeah, yeah, that's the where would they go? Truth Social, Gitter, these other ones. These other ones have all been labeled as like uh, gatherings of racists and uh, paramilitary groups and things. And <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be a tough sell. <laughs> Anyway, that being said, I think I think Twitter will probably continue to be the place where things happen. I think Trump will eventually join it because Truth Social is not going to succeed. Now that e- it, w- it was probably never going to succeed, it's definitely not going to succeed now that Elon Musk is running Twitter. Assuming he doesn't, this whole thing doesn't just flop. I think yeah, Twitter. Assuming, assuming here to the stay. deal goes through, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else, Brad? Nope, we covered all four points. We did. We did. Unbelievable. Look at us go. We're practically a news organization. <laughs> we can make a statement at the beginning and honor it. We I'm can proud we of can us. make time. I mean, we're a long ways from being able to do two minute interviews that they do in news stations where they get on, they say a statement that is basically a talking point. You reply by saying you're wrong and then you move on. I don't think we'd make it very far. I think we'd. You know what, Dan? I think things. you're wrong. I think we could do that. <laughs> you think we could do? That? But you know what? Let's just move on. <laughs> to be fair, I think anyone could do that. It's just, do we want to do that? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you all next week. Have a good one, guys. This has been an episode of Rethinking Politics. You can find us on all of the major podcasting apps or on YouTube. You can reach out to us at rethinkingpoliticspodcast at gmail.com or you can visit our website at rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com where you can support us via Patreon. Thanks and have a wonderful day.